In part two of our notes for this week, we're going to look at um, the effects of shifts, and we're going to look at the effects of taxes and trade on this equilibrium, and then we're also going to um, dive into elasticity. So we're going to, I'm going to show you the slides that have the causes of shifts in just a moment, but I just want you to review what actually happens to price and quantity if supply and demand shift. So if our equilibrium price right now is here, and our equilibrium quantity is here, um, we can have multiple things happen. We can have a shift in demand, right? If demand shifts to the right, you, can, you should be able to visualize that both price and quantity will increase. If demand shifts to the left, you should be able to see that both quantity, equilibrium quantity, and equilibrium price will decrease. Supply is going to have a little bit different impact, right? If supply shifts to the right, then what we see is that the price has actually gone down, right? While the quantity has gone up. So that's something to remember is that when supply increases or shifts to the right, that it causes an increase in quantity and a decrease in price. If supply, on the other hand, shifts to the left, up here, what we see is that price goes up and quantity goes down. So you want to make sure that you know the impacts on P and Q when we have shifts in supply and demand. Now I'm going to return to the graph that we had originally with our equilibrium price and quantity and just look at a few things that can happen to this. So we have the effects of taxes and the effects of trade. Taxes are going to work like any other shifter. They're not on our list of shifters, but if we have a tax generally, we assume that a tax is going to be um, passed on right to the, to the buyers. So what will probably happen is, well, actually, we usually show it this way. So a, a tax, a sales tax on an item, for example, what happens is the price, this is our equilibrium price, and this is our equilibrium quantity, what happens is, and this is a, a case of um, no, no, they're both about equally elastic, and, and that will be important later, but you can see that the price that's being paid by the consumers, okay, is now going to be this. The price being received by the producers is going to be this, okay, because the producers have to pay the difference between these two lines in tax. So this box right here represents revenue to the government. So the difference between these two lines is the amount that the, that the producer has to pay. And this triangle in here okay, is, as you can imagine, it's lost surplus, right? That's, that used to be part of consumer and producer surplus. And now nobody is actually buying these units anymore, right? These units are no longer being, being exchanged, being bought and sold. So we actually call this dead weight loss. It is a loss of efficiency due to a tax. Okay, um, another thing that we want to consider on here is the effects of trade. And so if we have a market that's at equilibrium, but it's what we call an autarky market, meaning that right now it is just a domestic market, there's no trade happening. Okay, that is spelled like this, autarky. Okay, in this autarky market, we have this price equilibrium and this quantity equilibrium. And if we open this uh, economy to trade, there's a couple things that can happen. But let's assume that the world price is actually lower than the price in this domestic economy. If that is the case, then what happens is we have a world price line right here. And instead of acting, it looks kind of like a price ceiling, but it doesn't act like a price ceiling because people are able to actually buy at this world price. So at that price, this is the quantity demanded, and this is the quantity that is supplied by domestic suppliers. Right? So the domestic suppliers are very upset because they've actually lost part of the market. But the difference here between the quantity being demanded by the consumers and the quantity being uh, produced by domestic suppliers, the difference is imports. Okay, and you can see that there is actually quite a bit of addition to surplus here. Surplus has been shifted. This was the old consumer surplus without trade. Now consumer surplus looks like this, right? The consumers are getting quite a bit of surplus. Producer surplus before trade was this big triangle, and now after trade is this little triangle, right? But this triangle here wasn't part of the surplus before, and it has been added. 
So trade actually adds to overall surplus. Um, we can use things to try to restrict this trade to protect the domestic suppliers. One thing we might do is impose either a quota or a tariff. And a quota is a limit on imports and a tariff is a tax on imports. And if we impose a quota or a tariff, I'm just going to draw a new line right here. We're going to imagine it's a tariff and we impose this price. Okay, this is now the price. And so people are no longer able to buy at the world price in this economy. Okay, so we still have our original equilibrium here. Okay, but now what happens is this point right here is what domestic consumers are able to actually buy. And this, it becomes the amount provided by domestic producers. And the amount of imports shrinks. So that becomes the amount of imports. You can see that we lost this area down here was part of surplus when we had free trade. And this now becomes a deficit price. So there's a lot of analysis to opening to trade. Um, but it all kind of makes sense if you think about it in terms of um, supply and demand. One other note I want to make is that if the world price is actually larger, I'm sorry, higher, okay, than the domestic price, if this is the world price, then what happens is a lot more of the goods become exports. So producers really benefit. You can see producer surplus now will be huge, okay, and consumer surplus will be very small because now domestic consumers are being priced out of the market. Um, foreign consumers. So lots of the goods will be shipped overseas or wherever, and we actually have this triangle of added surplus. So you might want to review these notes a few times to, to be able to wrap your head around that. Okay, I don't want to spend a long time going through um, the determinants of supply and demand because I know that you learned them in regular econ, so I am going to suggest that you review those and review the list in your textbook and ask me if you have questions about the shifters. The one thing that I do want to note about the supply and demand shifters is one on this list, which is, I believe, what's on this list, expectations. Um, changes in expectations don't necessarily get covered in regular econ. And the change, what we mean by a change in expectations is we mean a change in expectations about future prices. And so both um, consumers and producers are going to respond to these changes in expectations. So if you're a consumer and you expect the future price of a good to go up, you are likely to increase your demand for that good right now, right? So if you think the price is going up in the future and you're a consumer, you're going to run out and buy the good now, right? But if you're a producer and you expect the future price to go up, you do exactly the opposite. You hold on to your inventory and you wait. You don't sell it until the price actually goes up. So while consumers are shifting their demand to the right, producers are shifting their supply to the left, and what happens is you actually cause the price to go up. All right, so please let me know if you have questions about the supply and demand shifters. Um, we're going to spend the rest of our time in these notes uh, talking about elasticity, and elasticity is the concept of measuring how responsive consumers or producers are to a change in price. So if Delta Airlines were to cut ticket prices to London by 50% and ticket sales tripled, we would say that the consumers are very, very responsive to that change in price, and we would identify that as elastic demand. We'll define these a little more clearly. So that would be elastic. If XL Energy raised its rates 5%, but consumers only cut back electricity use by 2%, we would say that consumers were not very responsive, and we call that inelastic demand. So just in really general terms. And finally, if Pizza Hut doubles the price of canned pizza and sales fall by 50%, that would be a proportional response, okay? And we call that unit elastic. So those are the three introductory terms, elastic, inelastic, and unit elastic. All right, so typically demand curves slope downward because increases in price cause decreases in quantity demanded, but we can see that there, that's not always going to be the case. Some are actually vertical lines. Um, in that case, we define it as perfectly inelastic demand. That means that no matter what happens to the price, it can change and change and change, and people won't buy any more or less. Okay, and that would be the case for something that was definitely a necessity. The classic example is insulin, um, because somebody who's diabetic needs insulin, and they will buy it even if it gets more expensive, and somebody who doesn't need it won't buy it even if it gets less expensive. And then a horizontal line would represent um, perfectly elastic demand, and it's really, really hard to conceptualize that. 
I'm going to show you an almost perfectly horizontal line. And here what we're saying is the slightest, most minuscule change in price causes a very, very dramatic change in demand. Okay, and that's what we mean by perfectly horizontal. This unbelievable change in quantity of demand in response to the slightest change in price. Okay, supply, we can have the same. Perfectly inelastic supply would happen only when no more of the good can ever be produced. Um, so that would be a vertical line and perfectly elastic supply. Again, you really, it's hard to conceptualize perfectly elastic, but almost perfectly elastic. Slightest change in price causes a huge change in quantity of supply. All right. So most demand and supply curves are not perfectly inelastic or perfectly elastic, but in fact, elasticity varies along the curve. This is the general equation. Okay, when you think about elasticity, I want you to think percentage change in quantity over percentage change in price. Okay, it's easy to look at these different lines I just showed you that look like this, right? This or this or this. Okay, three different possible lines for demand. A and say, oh, it's slope. We're just talking about slope. But I just want to point out that it's, it's not slope because we are doing um, the x, change in x over change in y instead of change in y over change in x. And because we are calculating percentage change rather than change in the actual numbers. And because if you look down here at the actual equation, okay, we're going to be taking the absolute value. So a negative slope is not going to be calculated as a negative slope. We're going to take so this formula that you see here looks extremely complicated, but in fact, it's really not that big of a deal. The normal formula you would use for doing the percentage change, say, between point A and point B, um, you would say uh, the percentage change in price as you move from A to B is 8 minus 7 divided by 8, which is your starting point, right, equals 1 eighth. Okay, economists just want to make sure that whether we're moving from A to B or from B to A, we get the same results. And this is going to be a problem because percentage change in price from B to A is 7 to 8 divided by 7, right? Which is, and we're doing the absolute value, we're not going to worry about it, but it's negative. But you see, it makes a difference whether we started at $8 or started at $7. And so rather than doing that, what economists do is they say, okay, we're just going to do um, 7 minus 8, and we're going to divide it by 7.5. Okay, so whether it's 8 minus 7 divided by 7.5 or 7 minus 8. So this is called the midpoint formula because the denominator when we're calculating percentage change is the midpoint between these two points. Okay, you probably won't have to actually perform these calculations um, because you will actually just be given the numbers. But what you'll find is that if you calculate elasticity for a change that's in the up, upper portion, upper left portion of a demand curve, you're going to get a number that's going to be greater than one, okay? Because the change in quantity going from one unit to two is going to be much greater than the change in price, right? Whereas when you get down here, you can see the change in price has now gone, that over here it's changing from two to one, and the units is, is a much smaller change. So if, by definition, we're going to call a demand, uh, a point on a demand curve, unit elastic if the coefficient calculates to one, elastic if it's greater than one, and inelastic if it's less than one. So you should be able to identify those coefficients and understand what they mean. Okay, last I'm going to show you really quick the total revenue test, and this is a much easier way to calculate elasticity. So um, what we're at, going to wonder is what's going to happen to total revenue if the price changes. Here, at a price of $7, the quantity demand is 2 and total revenue is 14. So we want to know what happens if, to the total revenue if the price drops. The price drops to 6, quantity demand is now 3, total revenue goes to 18. So if the price goes down and the total revenue goes up, then we call that elastic. Okay, so that's going to be another quick test for elasticity. All right, um, you, might, you want to kind of familiarize yourself with, as I said, those coefficients. Okay, and these are the determinants of demand. So necessities are going to be more inelastic, luxury is more elastic. If there's more substitutes, it'll be more elastic because you can replace your purchase. Small purchases are going to be more inelastic because it won't bother you um, if the price changes. And we will get to supply next time.